What could be more important than the final instructions and words spoken by Jesus to his apostles? In today's episode, we explore and analyze the last paragraph of each of the Gospels and compare them to the original Gospel of the Lord. Deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. One thing that all Bibles, denominations, and Christian canon agrees on is that our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and rose again on the third day. Faith in our resurrected Christ is the cornerstone for us all and the building block for Western civilization. Without it, you'd still be worshipping sun gods, barking at the full moon, and twirling magic chickens over your head. But before we look at all five gospel versions of Jesus' last words to the apostles, let's get the lay of the land first. A little background to help us understand what we're reading. We're going to be comparing the ending of the four gospels in your modern Bible, the King James Version, to the original Christian Bible, the pre-Nicene Bible, with its single gospel, the Gospel of the Lord, that was used beginning in 144 A.D., hundreds of years before it was edited, translated, and met the approval of various kings and Roman emperors. Now, one of the interesting things you'll notice is that bits and pieces of that original gospel are found in all four of the modern Bible gospels, but more on that later. For now, let's set the stage on the four gospels in the modern Bible and what all churches agree on. First, all of the gospel authors are anonymous. They might have first names attached to the front, but all four are anonymous. Even if you wanted to pretend they weren't anonymous, two of the four weren't apostles. That would be Mark and Luke. In fact, Mark and Luke never met Jesus. But coincidentally, their Gospels came out after traveling with the Apostle Paul and seeing the original Gospel. I'll have links in the show notes if you'd like to see earlier episodes that we did on that story. So, back to the task. All four Gospels have different endings and feature different Apostles in the main roles adjacent to Jesus in the last paragraph. And each of the four have Jesus pronouncing a different set of last words and instructions before he ascends to heaven again. It's a kind of a Shoney's buffet of endings and last words, each gospel different from the other, like the alternate ending of a book or movie. I guess pick the one that you like best. Now, keep in mind as we go through this that these are supposed to be some of the most important words ever spoken by Jesus his last words and commands to the apostles before ascending to heaven. But none of the four anonymous authors can agree on what they were. Now, to spare you a never-ending warren of rabbit holes, I'm going to make life simple, and we're going to start with the last paragraph of the original, the Gospel of the Lord, and then begin our comparisons and analysis. For new viewers and listeners, the Gospel of the Lord is the revelation received by the Apostle Paul from Jesus on the road to Damascus. You might know it as the revelation. And we know he got it directly from Jesus directly because he tells us that in Galatians. But don't take my word for it. It's even in the modern Bible. In fact, let's read it together. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Unquote. Now, that sounds a lot better than using anonymous authors, doesn't it? So let's start there with the Gospel of the Lord, the Gospel with Paul's and Jesus' name on it, and read its final paragraph. And as they spoke these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and suppose that they had beheld a phantom. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And wherefore do reasonings arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that I am myself. For a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And while they still disbelieved for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you here anything eatable? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and ate before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you, while I was yet with you, 
that thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. There, that is the original, unedited, last paragraph, the core Christian canon, just as millions of the first Christians had it in 144 AD. Now, there's a couple things of interest. One, Jesus was in human form upon his return to the apostles, just as he was in human form when he descended to earth the first time at Capernaum. Did he require a human birth to visit the apostles for a final time after his resurrection? Of course not, no. He's the Son of God. He simply ascends and descends from heaven and takes on a human form. And he proved it to the apostles. He ate food right in front of them. Now, a spirit can't do that, only a human. They even saw the wounds on his hands and feet. Now, the second item of note are his last commands and instructions to the apostles. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Now, let's take a look at the last paragraph and words from the four anonymous Gospels. We'll do it in order of relevance from least to most and see how they stack up against the original and if we can learn anything. We'll start with John. Now, John is a little self-absorbed. In his final paragraph, it's mainly a discourse about John being the favorite apostle who Jesus says will live forever. And special mention is made of Peter's betrayal. Now, is this a clue about some wrangling between John and Peter? Who knows? It's also worth mentioning that John claims in John to be the only apostle that showed up for the crucifixion. Now, for the purposes of our discussion, the only item of interest is that it says Jesus appeared to the apostles on three different occasions. And there are no final instructions and commands to the apostles in John. Moving right along to Matthew. Matthew tells a story of Jews bribing Roman soldiers to say that the apostles took Jesus' body out of the tomb and that there was no resurrection. Now, I actually find this pretty believable. The rest revolves around Jesus appearing to them after they were told to go to a mountain in Galilee. Now, this also makes sense in that Jerusalem would have been a very dangerous place for them to be as the Jews were looking to kill them all. Galilee would have been much safer. And Jesus' final instruction to the apostles is to teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, given that the totality of Matthew reads like a guest list at a bar mitzvah, I was pleasantly surprised by the final paragraph and its lack of obtuse Judaizing. Now, next is Mark. And in Mark, Jesus appears first to Mary Magdalene. Mary tells the apostles of his visit, but they don't believe her. Later, Jesus appears to all 11 apostles during a meal and upbraids them for having hard hearts and not believing Mary, and by extension, not believing his resurrection. Now, unlike John, Mark's gospel has Jesus delivering a lengthy list of final commands and instructions, including preaching the gospel to all the nations that those who believe and are baptized will be saved, but those who don't believe will be damned. Jesus also tells them that in his name, those that believe will be able to handle serpents and drink poison and not be harmed. They will also heal the sick, speak in tongues, and cast out demons. Again, Jesus is clear that these things should be done in his name. Now, as an aside, that's something to think about if you're part of the Judaizing crowd that's begun substituting the name of Jesus with Yeshua. Go and start handling deadly snakes in the name of Yeshua instead of Jesus and tell us how that works out for you. And if you live, start remembering that one name is exalted above all others, and that name is Jesus. All right, that'll end my rant about these Judaizing heretics. Well, almost. Take special note that nowhere in any New Testament, of any Bible, in any Gospel, are the words Yeshua, Yahweh, or Yehovah found. Nowhere. 
For the Judaizers still confused about that, I suggest you find out what happened at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD. That's when your little cult and its carnal Hebrew laws were banished by all the apostles. In fact, I'll have a link in the show notes and make it easy for you. These heretical Judaizers are like wasps making nests everywhere, and they need to go. Now, this fittingly brings us to the last paragraph of our last gospel, Luke. Now, before I get into this, before I open this whole can of worms, let me just remind you that officially, Luke was written by an anonymous author who was not an apostle and never met Jesus. That's not up for debate. Unofficially, this is probably the same character that wrote Acts. Now, Acts was the anonymous bondo job that was supposed to fix all the holes and smooth out the rough edges where the Gospels contradicted each other and the storyline maybe had some leaks. It put a Judaizing bow around the whole package, and as some biblical scholars are fond of saying, it domesticated Paul. Now, that's really just a nice way of saying they edited his scripture and minimized his role. But let's say it was Luke the physician who traveled with Paul the Apostle. He would have seen and heard Paul's Gospel of the Lord. He would have been intimately familiar with it. No doubt he had a copy of it. And we know this Luke person wrote his Gospel right after traveling with Paul. Oh, what a coincidence. And what do we find when we compare the original Gospel with Luke's? And what a surprise. It turns out it's a cut-and-paste job of the Gospel of the Lord, plain as day. Now, viewers of today's episode are looking at the side-by-side comparison. Listeners can grab a copy of the Modern Bible and open up to the last paragraph of Luke and the last paragraph of the original Gospel. And by the way, you can get a free copy of that at theveryfirstbible.org.org. Now, look at it, word for word. Now, I've been studying how the Judaizers edited the Bible for years, and I'd say 95% of it was pretty artfully done. But this example from Luke is just laughable. They literally copied it word for word and then added Judaizing language at the end of a few sentences. It reads like a fifth grader plagiarizing material for his book report. And it is in their zeal to Judaize the original that they make their fatal mistake. Remember earlier we talked about how dangerous Jerusalem was in the time immediately following the murder of Jesus by the Jews. It would be the last place the apostles would want to be. In fact, it was so bad that Peter denied even knowing anybody named Jesus. And if they did go there, they would certainly keep a very low profile. Getting stoned to death was in the future for many of them. Just ask St. Stephen. And yet, despite all that, here we have Luke writing, and I quote, And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God, unquote. Now, do I even have to explain how laughable that is? Do you have any idea what the Jews would have done to them if they even came near that temple, much less entered it and started praising Jesus? In fact, didn't we just read in Matthew that, They were all told to go to a safe mountain in Galilee? Sorry, Luke, that dog won't hunt. But we do thank you for at least getting some of the original gospel into the modern Bible. In fact, you'll find bits and pieces of the original scattered throughout the entire New Testament if you know what to look for. Now, the main takeaway from today's episode is that you can still read that original pre-Nicene Bible if you want to. The truth is there if you want it. Remember, Jesus transcends race. He doesn't play favorites. The only chosen people are those who are baptized in his name and believe in him. Easter is a celebration of our risen Christ, not his death on a cross. And his last words to his apostles and to us all were that we should preach to all nations repentance and the remission of sins in his name. Not anybody else's name, his name. Jesus Christ. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. 
Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. Ten books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.